Okay, I make it six o'clock, so good evening everybody and welcome to April's planning committee. Before we go down the agenda, we'll introduce ourselves, but just to start with, this meeting is being live streamed on the Council's YouTube channel. The recording of this meeting will remain online for four years, and if you are present in the chamber, you are consenting to appearing in the recording and broadcast, which may also be used for training purposes. Okay, so we'll introduce ourselves. When we come to the um, applications, what will happen is the officer will present a report. If I've got speakers, and I do have speakers today, I'll invite them forward. They have five minutes, and they will go back. I'll, I'll bring them in the order of ward member, um, speaker again, speaker four, if I've, if I've got them. And then um, we'll open it up to committee to ask questions of officers, and then go into debate, and then hopefully come to a decision. Okay, so my name's Gordon Taylor, and I chair. Uh, Michael Ronan, Locum Plan. Oliver Brown, Democrat, Conductor Services Officer. Board uh, and Vice Chair of this committee and my last meeting. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> um, David Brown, Councillor for Hucklecote. Joanne Brown, Councillor for Barnwood. Lorraine Campbell, Councillor for Tuffley. Angela Conda, Councillor for Kings Hill and Wooden. <clears throat> Alistair Chambers, just in the nick of time, Councillor for Matson, Robinswood White City. Councillor Howard Hyman, Elmbridge Ward. Well, that was a bit quick. Andrew Garrell, Councillor for Radnydale Ward. Great. Uh, Paula D, Councillor for Tuffley. Mark Sweet, Gloucester County Council Highways Officer. Yeah, Ian Hunt, Highways Development Management, so Gloucestershire County Council. Sean Herbert, Planning Manager, Development Management. And Craig Stock, Planning Officer. Okay, um, before we run down the agenda, just to let you know, I'm going to swap the order of the application as we probably worked out, just because we've got quite a lot of people here for the second one. And so we will, when we get to it, we'll take item six before item five. Um, so apologies, we've got from... Uh, yeah, so we've had apologies from Councillor Sawyer, hence why Councillor Hyman is standing in, and Councillor Tolman as well. Okay, any declarations of interest? Um, yes, I should tell everybody that I was canvassing on Curtis Haywood Drive Road, whatever, um, on Saturday, and I realise now I met the applicants, but we obviously didn't discuss anything about this. And I don't know them, I've never met them before. Thank you. No, no others, no. Excuse me, Chair, if I may Sorry. just clarify with Councillor Conn. Okay, so are you happy for me to sign off the minutes of the last meeting? Yeah, for the last time. Also. Okay, so we've had two sets of late material. One helpfully came out quite a while ago, is that, and one came out today with, with just some pictures in. Has everybody seen them? Happy to know? Yeah, I've just seen pictures, but you can't get on site. I have a picture. The, 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 yes, the late material. Okay. The latest one just had a few pictures in it, so the ones that came out today. So if you could have a look at that. The other ones came out before Easter. Okay. All right. Okay, thank you, Councillor Tracy. Right, let's move to item six then, so whenever you're ready. Evening, everyone. Um, this application is at 52 Curtis Hayward Drive. Um, that's a detached residential property in a cul-de-sac in Quenchley Field Court. Um, you'll see from the description of development that um, they are applying for the conversion of a garage into a habitable room. Um, note the word retrospective beforehand. Um, so the key point to note from the outset 
um, <coughs> is that the physical works here have already taken place. Um, permission is sought to regularise um, the physical works and to secure consent for the use of the converted garage as a habitable room. <coughs> now, this next slide just um, briefly mentions the councillor <coughs> excuse me, reason for referral. Um, so this was omitted from the report, so this is just to clarify um, why this application is being heard in front of tonight's committee. Um, so you'll see the, um, the wording there, the, the, the call-in from August, April 2021. Um, the reason you'll see there in italics is um, verbatim, so that, that's the word of the councillor himself. Um, the next couple of slides are just intended to um, give a rough overview of the location of the application site. So some of you may know the application site, others not, so it's the area included within the red line there. So it's a cul-de-sac in Quedgley Field Court, it's a detached property. Um, the next slide will show similar, so this is the same view, um, but in an aerial mapping uh, format. So the next few slides just give a brief overview of um, the physical changes that are proposed. Um, and this shouldn't take an awful lot of time, it's fairly simple. Um, just one thing to note at, at the outset is that I've referred to the plans here as existing and proposed, because that's a standard terminology. Um, it should be pointed out that the existing plans um, are currently in place because this is a retrospective application. Uh, sorry, I'll rephrase that. The existing plans are the former plans. Um, the, the physical works were actually undertaken in 2020. So existing is former, proposed is the current state of affairs, um, if you like. Um, so in terms of the external physical changes, the, the entire extent of that is simply to replace um, this white wood panelled garage door that you can see um, here with um, <clears throat> a pair of windows and the door with white UPVC um, sort of materials. Um, so that, that's the extent of the material changes. Internally, um, the existing or the, the former plans uh, refer to it as a garage. So it was a, it was a garage up until 2020 um, when the conversion take place, took place. Um, and the proposed plans um, refer to this room as a spare room. Um, now, the description of development refers to it as a habitable room. Um, this is probably an opportune moment to explain that aspect. So a habitable room can refer to any one of a number of things. Um, bedroom, dining room, living room typically. So one of the main principal uses um, in within a dwelling house, but not a kitchen, not a bathroom, but living room dining room, bedroom, those are the kind of things that we'd expect um, from a habitable room. Um, so granting permission here would allow for some flexibility in terms of how that space could be used, albeit within those fairly well understood limits. Um, and it's also worth noting that in a majority of circumstances, garage conversions of this nature wouldn't require planning permission. Um, this is set out within the report, but um, permitted development rights were removed um, for this application. Um, when the estate was granted permission originally in 1992. So that's why an application has been required in this instance. Um, the best indication of how, uh, that we have of how this garage has been used and is proposed to be used in the future um, comes both from information submitted by the applicants um, and um, from a couple of site visits that have been conducted um, by officers throughout the determination period um, of the application. Um, so it's been indicated that there's an intention there to use this ground floor bed, um, converted garage as uh, ground floor bedroom accommodation for the use of one of the applicants. Um, so that applicant suffers from a de deteriorating mobility um, and it's anticipated that he will require the use um, of ground floor level access accommodation at some point in the near future. Um, the current state of affairs, um, so the, the, the site or the garage um, is currently, and, and presumably for a little while longer at least, um, will be used as something more akin to a home office. Um, so the applicants run a domiciliary care company, um, which is essentially, they employ a series of carers who conduct home visits to visit their clients, typically elderly people, um, in their homes. So the applicants administrate the company, um, you know, they do desk jobs, essentially, um, to run this business from that home office. So, so that's the current state of affairs. Um, 
So th this latter usage has attracted some consternation amongst neighbours. Um, the key point to make, and that this is made within the report, um, is that the LPA, the local planning authority, would only be prepared to accept this kind of business usage, provided that it's of a low enough intensity to not cause a detrimental impact upon local community and that of neighbours, um, such that we would be satisfied that it would comfortably fall essentially under the realm of a habitable room in, in all but name. Um, now, to this end, paragraph 6.9 of the report sets out the upper limit, in essence, of, um, what, we, of what has been proposed by the applicants in terms of the nature, um, the upper parameters, the, the, the type of that business use. So, it, in, in effect, it sets out how they would be using that as a working from home space and sort of the upper parameters of any associated um, activities, such as visits from staff members, etc. So that's just to repeat, that's all in paragraph 6.9 of the report. Um, so any, any approval would be subject to a condition ensuring the use of the converted garage for purposes that are ancillary to or incidental to the enjoyment of the dwelling house. Um, and that condition is within paragraph 7.2. Um, officers are satisfied that a low level, low intensity business stroke home office use would fall under that definition fairly comfortably, um, as per the upper parameters mentioned within that paragraph 6.9. And that condition is, is worded and is inserted to any prospective um, approval with the express intention um, that that would allow for the subsequent, um, any subsequent enforcement action that may be required should those upper parameters be breached or exceeded. Um, but, and this is I guess the key point, the wording of this condition does not limit them to a business or a bedroom use, Rather, it allows for a range of possible rooms that would fall under that habitable room bracket, um, the type of rooms that you would expect typically to see within a dwelling house. Um, so that's that aspect explained. Um, the next three slides simply are a few photos, um, just to give you a perspective of what we're looking at here. Um, the first one is just the, the current frontage of the house, so the, the physical changes that we've been discussing, the ex external physical changes. It is indeed limited to that. Um, bottom right hand corner on the ground floor with the pair of windows and the door at the front so that was previously a wood panelled garage um, and that's what that looks like now um, that's just a slightly different view looking from a bit um, further down the road and showing the front driveway and then we've just got a pair of photos looking up and down the road um, from the application site um, so that's just to give a perspective of the site where it sits, etc. The officer recommendation is to approve subject to conditions, um, chiefly that condition being the one that I've mentioned, um, condition two, uh, which refers to the, the um, ancillary or incidental usage. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I've got um, two speakers here. So, Councillor Lewis, first of all. Evening, all committee. Um, this is the first time in 22 years I've actually sat in this chair, so this is novelty for me. And this happens to be your last one as a group. Anyway, let's get down to business. Thank you very much for hearing me. Um, there's two things I want to say about this. A, it is a business and it's not just one or two cars. They've got 27 employees dropping in now and again, to say the least. Um, there's one employee that's there full time. It happens to be their daughter, but she's still an employee and she's not, she goes there five days a week, opens the doors up, does the letters and all the rest of it. And then other people come in to get all their supplies and this, that and the other. So it's not a small um, office, shall we say. It is quite a busy office. They don't all come at the same time. I understand that and whatever, but they are, as you can see, it's a quiet cul-de-sac. Shouldn't have a business in there. End of story. Um, throughout COVID, totally get it. It's, uh, they needed somewhere. They couldn't hire anywhere because there was nowhere to be hired or whatever. So they set it up from their own house. But that's gone now from over a year. So why is it still being run there and all the rest of it? Secondly, that door at the front is the most hideous thing I've ever seen on a nice estate. It's not... The old, you know, you have the sort of wall at the front and then two window or a window. It's a front door, which is no good for the person who's going to have the de degenerative um, um, illness, which I'm very sorry about, don't get me wrong, but they can't get a wheelchair through it. 
So what is the point of it? Why not make it into the front door, which is a nice oak front door, and they had a nice oak garage. Why can't we have that in keeping with every other house in the estate? They've had garage conversions, obviously, um, but it is an industrial door. You know, one you like uh, might see oh, I don't know, a car maintenance company just open up and whatever. It's not an estate type door. It's not in keeping with everything for the street scene. Um, it, it's, I can't describe it other part from hideous. It, was, it is awful. Um, I wouldn't want it on my own house just as a stopgap. Um, and, and also I think the actual floor inside has been raised up to come to level. Um, so they can use inside to get in there anyway. So, and also that wall where they've got a door for a disabled person, maybe having a bed under it, can't do it because it's got a door. So I think it's highly inappropriate, not keeping with the street scene whatsoever. And it's still being used as a fairly busy business, quite an essential, very caring business, but it's in the wrong place and it should have proper, um, offices and storerooms and things like that. Now, I understand where Craig's coming from, don't get me wrong, but it's if you're living opposite and people are in, out, in, out, in, out, you know, and it's they're not all there at the same time, but they are there all day, every day, especially the one. Um, and that does envisit people parking on the on the pavement, on the road. And it's not a very wide road as uh, office um, as um, um, a normal sort of car cul-de-sac roads you know very if you had to get you got one car in there one car in there you couldn't get a bus car a dust car through so it does cause a problem i know how you'll say, how you will say it's uh, not causing a problem but it does for the people who live there and around there um but my real problem is the actual nature of the work that's happened it is awful and not in keeping with the street scene and the, the nature of the quiet cul-de-sac so that's all i would like to say and i will now Leave it all up to you. Thank you very much. And uh, it's been nice working with some of you. So. <laughs>
comply with the joint core strategy section SD4, which is what the um, Quedgley Town Council said about. I mean, Mr Stock does state in paragraph 6.6 .6 of his report that other properties in Curtis Hayward Drive have um, similarly converted their garage and installed windows in the place of the garage. And that's true, but it's a window, not a door. And if you go down the whole street, there is not another property that has got a door and windows like that replacing their um, garage. And they're, you know, they're all windows. And those front, and they're all in keeping with the frontage. The windows are the same in, you know, to match the rest of their properties. Um, what goes on in those rooms, like you say, habitable spaces, can be many things. Um, it could be a bedroom, it could be an office. In COVID, lots of people started working from home and they continue to do so. And it's been really good. It really suits some people. So something good perhaps came out of that, although it was horrendous at the time. Um, but um, this isn't, you know, um, anything that it does stand out as not being like the rest of the street. So we sort of do sort of question what said that, you know, it, it is in keeping and everybody, you know, lots of other conversions have happened. Secondly, um, it's clear that this conversion is being used as an office for a business, which is registered at the property. And it shows up on Google Maps as the registered office. So it's all up there, but that's what it is. Um, and although that Mr Stock does say, and he mentioned himself about paragraph 1.7, um, where they've had information submit, submitted from the applicant and the planning officers have been out a couple of times to observe the office, um, it, it's very different. It's not, they say it's reverted to a standard home office. It hasn't. Um, those of us living there know and have seen that it hasn't changed from the day that it actually started um, and it was converted in 2020. So um, there are lots of staff working there. You've heard the number of staff that work in the premises. The business manager comes every day. She unlocks that office. She goes in, works, comes out, locks the door and goes. So, and as far as the parking and everything is concerned, it is quite a narrow street. Um, when visitors visit, that's fine. We all have problems if we've got lots of visitors occur arriving at one time. Um, but the cars are jumping on the end of the drive and the tail end blocks the footpath. So people can't actually walk along the footpath when staff are visiting. So, and with that many staff, there are staff coming every day and sometimes two or three staff visiting. So I just, you know, for, for us that are living there, we're seeing it very differently from what is put out in the plans and what the planning officers have seen. So um, we just would like to think that habitable space is a bit, okay. Okay, so we'll open it up to members for questions, first of all, and then maybe debate. Councillor Morgan. Could we have a look at the slide again, which showed the photos? Um, because I'm interested to see if other properties along there um, have still got wooden doors. I see there's a, a white metal garage door to the left. And I'm sort of seeing that these houses are, um, as far as I can see, a number of different um, designs. Um, and I wanted to ask, uh, the, has the officer any information uh, regarding other disruption that is being caused in the vicinity um, to residents other than the, the parking issue? I can certainly see that extra cars there. I believe it is a four bedroom house. <coughs> Um, so there could be sort of certainly up to five residents, five people living there. So there could be a number of cars, you know, two, three, four, potentially five, legitimately owned by people living in the house. So I'm just trying to get a feel for um, any other problems that are being caused uh, that you may be aware of. Thank you. Um, in my recollection, and um, I should add that a more comprehensive 
Um, the summary of the neighbour comments is included within the report. Um, so there are four rounds of neighbour consultation. So they stretch from autumn 2020 through to about last month, give or take, or February 2024. So we've had four rounds of neighbour consultation. The main one in my recollection that has come up um, has related to, to car parking and highways impacts. Um, those concerns generally were framed in the terms of amenity. So the comments might, might have said something along the lines of, we don't believe there's enough parking, uh, enough off street parking here to accommodate the number of vehicles that we are observing with our own eyes. Um, those comments were generally framed as being not just an issue of, of parking and highway safety, but one of amenity. But in, in my recollection, that, that would be the principal um, amenity impact that was noted within the neighbour comments. Um, I, I don't recall an awful lot in terms of um, noise or, or anything else like that. The, the business that's being operated from the garage isn't um, it wouldn't, it's not what you would call a noise generating or an odour generating um, use. So I can't, I don't recall any other disruption noted. Um, but as I say, the, the, the neighbour comment section provides a more comprehensive summary um, on, on that matter. Any more questions? Fine. They mentioned um, policy SD4 that it wasn't compliant with. Can you just discuss that I yeah yeah you've not come to that conclusion yeah of course i can so um yeah so aside from the parking and the related amenity impacts with parking um one of the the main um objections that has been expressed by neighbors has been and indeed by the two speakers we've just had um does relate to um the the visual appearance the the, the appearance the design of that new frontage um and the contention being that the replacement of the previous um, panelled garage door, as you can see here, with the um, pair of windows with the UPVC sort of panelling and, and the door, the contention being that that um, is out of keeping with the character of the, the dwelling itself, the, the wider street scene, neighbourhood, etc. Um, so policy SD4 is one of the main policies that we use in terms of um, design. Um, so the, the conclusion reached within my report differs from the one reached by um, a number of the, the, um, the commenters and, um, and the people that have just spoken. Um, so my, my interpretation of, of the plans here in terms of their visual appearance is, you know, is it the prettiest thing you or I have ever seen in our lives? No, it's not, but that's not the policy test and that, that's not, the, that's not the, um, the basis upon which I'm making a recommendation. So, so the, the judgment that's made within my report is, is that the, the, you know, the, the new frontage um, utilises a, a palette of colours and materials that is broadly in keeping with other properties you see on the street, which typically have, you know, a, albeit a, a range of colours. You see a black front door here, but, you know, you see typically white UPVC um, framed windows uh, up and down the street. Um, so the, the, the feeling from my point of view that this was policy compliant with the policies that relate um, to design doesn't cause a detrimental or a, you know an unduly detrimental impact upon the visual amenity of the area um, it's not doesn't represent a major departure from what you might see elsewhere up and down the street um, and it's not bringing about any sort of observable um, harm shall we say to the street scene e even if you know people are right to point out that it may differ from you know the wood panelled front door you know that that is a there is a difference there but it's certainly within the range of acceptable materials colors etc um so that that's the basis upon which my decision has been made my recommendation has been made rather um and i am satisfied that that's policy compliant in terms of sd4 um and other design related policies thank you uh councillor morgan's indicated again okay and then we'll go brown and kind of... um Coming back to the parking issue, if the committee were minded to approve the change of use, the recommendation, would it be unreasonable for a condition to be placed that the existing grass area, uh, which is next to the drive, is replaced with further off-street car parking? 
which might help alleviate the issue that is faced by residents of the on-street parking. Would that be unreasonable for us to ask for that to be done? We, we, yeah, we've got we've got a highways officer, two highways officers in attendance. Um, I guess the test, the test of any such policy would be, is it necessary to make the application acceptable? Um, in making my recommendation, I, I certainly didn't think that was the case. And that's not a condition that's been recommended by the highways officers, but I can throw it to them and see what they say. Hi, uh, yeah. Um, um, well, you've got my um, my response, sort of like my assessment. Um, with regards to this, um, I assessed it on the basis of how it was submitted as a habitable room. So, um, as was stated by the case officer, it could be a number of uses. Um, uh, it has operated as a home office. Um, it could continue to operate as a home office. It could operate as additional living space or it could operate as a bedroom. Um, I think, sort of, on the basis of my assessment, and I've been out to visit the site, I visited again today. I noticed two cars parked on the driveway um, at the time. Um, and I know from sort of like uh, objections and comments, there have been sort of like issues raised about on-street parking, which is difficult to relate specifically to the property, although it could be, as well as other um, uh, neighboring properties um, around the site. I, I, it, as sort of like the case officer said, um, you, you you could sort of like um, uh, look at sort of like um, making additional parking off street fronting the the property, and there is from my um, assessment on site space to do that. The grass area would be large enough to accommodate additional parking space. Um, so, if it was if it was looked into, um, and I believe under permitted development, um, they are able to sort of convert that space into a driveway anyway um, without the need for planning permission although the case officer could probably confirm that um, if necessary uh, thank you chair um i noticed there was an application submitted in 1999 that was refused for turning one of the rooms into a study in my opinion a study is more personal than an office which is more commercial business like and i just wonder is it the same property owner now than it, that as it was then, or is it a different owner? And on what grounds was it turned down in 1999? Um, I, don't, I can't answer the question in terms of whether or not it's a different property owner now to what it was then. Um, planning permission, when planning permission is granted, it's granted to the land and the application site, so it doesn't stay with an applicant. So to, to my mind, I, I can't see that whether or not the the occupant or the resident has, has changed or is the same has any particular bearing um i believe i mean obviously that, that application was refused a long time ago in in looking into the site history when i was determining the application i believe that reason the 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 refusal came from a highways objection in that instance so my understanding is that that so obviously the sort of origin of this if you like is that when the estate was granted back in 1992 the permitted development rights were removed um, to convert that garage into um, a, a, a living room, so to speak, because um, ordinarily that could be done without planning permission. So a, a, an application was submitted here. It was refused. My, my understanding for reading through that case file was that highways had um, a much more, um, shall we say, strict outlook on those issues than they might do now. So, um, so yeah, I, I think that came from a highways objection. But just because they objected back in 1999 doesn't necessarily mean they would object today. And I, indeed, I, be, I believe in their response, they do note that um, the majority of um, integral garages these days are actually too small to accommodate um, modern sized cars. So some of the factors around that objection may be sort of outdated as well. Thank you. That's quite interesting. Nice to be picked up. Um, Councillor Condo was next. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering whether, I mean, I, I don't think the door is beautiful, but it's not exceptional. Um, it's of a type seen in many places now. If it wasn't for the door, would we still have these objections? And I'm surmising that we would on parking grounds and on the amount of traffic generated in and out of that front door. Um, but I think it's a cul-de-sac, so it's not got through traffic. There'll be a turning circle at the end of the cul-de-sac where, where cars can turn and, and drive out. 
without having to do three point turns in the middle of the road outside this property. Um, there is ample parking off the road and it seemed when I was there um, unexpectedly on Saturday, it's a quiet road and there wasn't a lot of on street parking, although it was a Saturday, people would have been out maybe. Um, so to my mind, it's an issue about the amount of coming and going to this office. Um, yes, it's a business people need to visit. It's not exceptional compared with living, for example, next to um, a student house, for example, or a care home, which might have minibuses coming, um, large bin lorries emptying, commercial skips, um, and so on. So I think in keeping it in proportion, um, this is not exceptional. Thank you. I've got a couple more people indicated, but I've got a sort of question. Um, what we're looking at here is is, a, is an application for change of use from a garage to a habitable room, which could be a bedroom, which could be a lounge, which could be a, a home office. Is the I mean, obviously, it's being used as an office and there is trip generations at the moment. <coughs> Has there been a separate um, enforcement case on on this? Uh, and, and, well, and I guess the question also is, is even even if this is granted, the the use might not be acceptable, would then still be able to trigger a, an enforcement a, a case? Yeah, so um, I don't believe there's been any separate enforcement action relating to um, this application or this application site. Um, so the application was submitted originally in 2020. Uh, it was submitted after the works had taken place. Um, it was then, as um, one of the speakers has pointed out, it was then reconsulted on. Um, at that point, the description of development was amended to refer to it explicitly as retrospective, and the plans were corrected to show exactly what they had done. Um, but no, I, I don't believe there's been an enforcement action taken on, on the site. And indeed, I think the application has essentially served as a uh, a conduit to regularise the, the sort of situation anyway, because that's sort of, I suppose, the most obvious way of, um, as I say, regularising that um, sort of unauthorised use. In terms of that wider question around enforcement, I mean, obviously, the neighbour comments that have been received suggest that the business use um, that has been in operation and indeed st still is in operation um, is more intense than than than, than as is described within the report, um, and sort of the following sort of implication that's made in those comments is that this should be a change of use application rather than just a habitable room. Um, so my report does touch upon that um, period of more intense operation of that business during COVID in sort of 2020 2021 um, in terms of staff making visits to collect PPE. Um, to conduct training sessions, etc. Um, the information submitted by the applicants and indeed the observations that myself and the previous case officer um, made on our site visits, and on those site visits we were accompanied by the enforcement officer, um, the information that we, we gathered from sort of those exercises did suggest that that, more, that period of more intense activity during COVID has since wound down, um, such that it sort of constitutes something more akin to a standard working from home setup. Um, now, the, mo the more recent neighbour comments cast doubt on whether this is really the case. Um, th those comments do suggest that the staff visits are still more frequent and they're not limited just to appointment only. Um, and they're sort of Im implying that there are continuing parking impacts. And I've got no reason to cast doubt on, you know, the, the veracity of those observations. The key point that I just want to, to sort of stress is that this application isn't for an unlimited use of, uh, to operate a business. That's not what's being proposed here. Um, they're applying for a habitable room. We're satisfied as officers that a low level business use would fall comfortably within that sort of bracket. Information was collected from the applicants um, by myself and that's within paragraph 6.9 asking the explicit question of them. Um, you know, what is the upper limit of, of the staff movements, comings and goings that you are proposing here would take place following the granting of any planning permission? Um, so the sort of upper parameters and the limits that I, I mentioned in paragraph 6.9 have been volunteered by them. Um, so that, that's of their own sort of submission. 
Um, so the purpose of that condition and that information is to sort of make clear that we're not giving carte blanche for the business to be operated as they please. Rather, we have to be satisfied that any business use is within those limits. Um, so, yeah, that, that's the basis upon which we'd be granting planning permission. And, and following that, were we to grant planning permission, we've got a clear set of parameters against which enforcement action could be taken were they to be exceeded. So that's kind of how we've delineated between the, the assessment of the application yeah. and the enforcement matter. See, to me, it sounds like what should have been applied for was a change of use application, but that's not what we've got in front of us. What we've got in front of us is is a change of use of the room into a, into, into a habitable space. Um, but it sounds like from the neighbours, what the applicant should have applied for maybe was a change of use of, of the thing to a business. And what I'm trying to get at is by is we're not we're not really here to to to, to determine that because that's not what's in front of us. But but should we grant the permission subject that we're happy to the other the the, the other that, that it passes SD four and and it's okay that that room becomes either a living room or a or a home office or something like that. No, that's, that's what we're being asked to decide. As, that's what I'm getting from this. I want to bring other people in because I'm conscious we're taking a long time and I've still got Councillor Tracy and Councillor Chambers who want to speak and then Councillor Gravel. So Councillor Tracy, you are next. Um, first of all, I can't remember sitting on, on this, but um, I mean, looking at the, pe uh, the picture there, it's not in keeping with the cul-de-sac rule. Could I, in the deeds of this house, I don't know if it's a question you can ask, are they allowed to do business there? How would one know that, please? I, I don't know, but it's not a planning consideration, so... I, I appreciate that, but I, I know that... Uh, well, have gone on the old planning, yeah. And how many, actually, how many houses are in this cul-de-sac, please? I do not know the answer to that question, but this is number 52, so at least 52. <laughs> That's a big Cody's that then, isn't it? Um, and am I looking... No, I've got loads. Am I looking for service users, what lives in there? Well, I mean, you know, people... What exactly do you mean by service well, users? Well, people with um, disability... Uh, um, um, uh, interest, disabled interest and things like that. Oh, okay. Um, I mean, I, I'm I guess the, for the, word now. <laughs> the, the, the key point to make is that the identity of the applicants probably doesn't represent a planning consideration. As I mentioned earlier, the permission, any permission would be granted to the land or the site itself rather than the applicants. Okay. So the identity well, of who they are isn't necessarily a consideration. Having said that, one of the sort of, um, um, sort of proposed or possible um, uses of that room would be for, for ground floor um, accessible accommodation. We're only talking about the garage, not the house itself. E exactly. So that 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 this idea. Is where I'm getting confused. Yeah. Here. So the idea to use the garage as a, a ground floor bedroom is has relates to one of the applicants who has worse, a worsening mobility situation. So I guess that might answer your question. So, and does the people who own the house do they live in? Do they live in that dwelling. <clears throat> yes, they do. They live in that dwelling. So the daughter comes in and out to do the work. Okay. And 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 then would there so the people who live there in that they would look after like the night shifts and things like that if um, people with learning difficulties would need uh, on our night shifts and things like that. So it's not, you know, what I mean, where I'm coming from. So I think I've lost I think I've lost you. Well, if, uh, I'm, yeah, I know what you're saying. Yeah, what I'm saying is we break all these rooms in this garage and blah blah blah. And incidentally, every photo you showed me, there's got a car outside that garage. Um, so um, I wanna know if there's a, like somebody on call at night for the people who's used I'm paying for their facilities in this home. So I think I think you, you may have slightly question. misunderstood the, the use of this garage. So this garage is used as a home office, um, principally for the the two people, the married couple that live at the property. Yeah. Um, their daughter also comes, um, by the sounds of it, multiple times a week as well to use this home office. They they run, they, they sort of administrate a 
domiciliary care company. So they essentially do office jobs. What, what their office job entails is that they em employ a series of carers. Office business. I, I, I've lost the plot for residents. They, they employ a series of carers. Those carers make home I visits to properties know. around the city to, to clients who are generally elderly. Um, but the, the use of the office itself is, you know, as a home office for essentially desk jobs. So the, the home people. office, you're on about the government is paying for this home? No, Pam. Um, no, I'm just trying to break it down. No. A home office is an office in a, somebody's that. house. They live in the house. Yeah, yeah so they, specific, they, yeah. they live in the That's house. I want to get it all right. The people that use the home office live in the house, with that, the exception yeah. of that um, that daughter. I, I get right. that. But anyhow, so... Um, um, we've got other people waiting to speak. Well, so I've, got, we've I've got, got many questions we've got, here. They've got to be planning related as well, remember. I, I, I appreciate that. But I can go into debate on that. But uh, while I'm staying here... Uh, I, I going back to this building, I don't know it got through on the last planning because it's not in keeping with that code is like as such. And also, uh, like it was said earlier on, with those double doors in there, it creates an office. I thought we had to keep all garages now for... Oh, I've got... Yeah, carry on, I'll go into debate. Uh, Councillor Chambers and then Councillor Gravelza. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, how many complaints has there been in total from neighbours? That's a good question. So we... There's been 10. I think it's 10 and then yeah. there's one more from the late material, is it? So that would make yeah. 11. The reason yeah. I say that is I've gone through the 10 complaints while we're here just on planning boards. I noticed all the complaint point, bullet points haven't been listed in the planning documents that we've been received. And you wouldn't notice that unless you went through the full planning portal. Why has not all the bullet points of the concerns of the neighbours not been documented within the documentation we've been provided? Sorry, I, I don't quite follow. Um, if you go on planning portal, there's individual letters from each resident that has raised concerns, letter 1 to 10, each one being an, an individual different person. Each person on their letter states different objections and reasons why for the concerns raised for the building control. What I noticed is there is some sentences and points of objection that have been listed in the letters that has not been documented in the circulated paperwork. So I think that's something to bear in mind. Um, I've also noticed that Quedgie Town Council's comments, they've been listed, um, but there have been a, a three separate com a letter of objections that they've submitted. Um, given that, that shows obviously there's an overwhelming concern, my understanding from these documentations provided. I also note that there's um, one, two, three, six current properties on the street of Curtis Hayward, and you're looking at around 60 properties that have been converted to garages. That's 10% of the properties. And looking at the documentation online and permitted development, um, I can't see any complaints for those other five properties. That makes me realise, in my opinion, that the, the main complaints possibly are down to the street scene, the look of the plastic doors and the industrial type building. So if you can go back to the other photo on a slightly different angle, that's it. So the property on the right with the render, my understanding is that that garage has been converted. Is that correct? Um, I'm not entirely sure. Well, it quite, has. Quite possibly. The yeah. drive there is converted garage. Well, presumably that was... Pres yeah, before, sorry, it wasn't a trick question. My point is, is it doesn't look like it's been converted because it's been <laughs> converted in line with the street scene. So is there a way to put in the recommendation or condition that it has to align with the existing street scene? Because there's six other pro uh, properties that have had that same conversion as the one next door with the render, and it matches quite fittingly. Usually, carriage, carriage conversions of that fit are, um, as you said, home offices and additions to the property, whether a further bedroom, therefore not needing an additional access. So my concern is, is this is purely down, um, would you not agree that this is purely down to possibly a business office rather than that of a residential home setting? Question number one. Question so, number so two. Chair, can I just jump in? Um, so, that, so the officer is obviously here to to assist. Yeah, the officer is questions. entirely entirely yeah. impartial. Yeah, um, and and we're all working together to no, reach an end, an end goal. Yeah. Um, the the questions are if you if you come with the questions and then the, and that the officer has an opportunity to okay. answer. All right then. But the questions were. We just need to be careful that the questions aren't leading in any they way, possibly are. and then lead, yeah, and then lead, leading the debate, okay. and then debate the debate not being impartial. I wouldn't do it. I just wanted to just 
uh, point it out. So we just don't go off. No, on, of course on I would do, do that. I'm just trying to s understand that there's six other properties on the street. Has there been other um, complaints that you're aware of? Question number one. Of, of course, of course. Um, the honest answer to that would be I, I, I don't know. I haven't poured for each application individually to check whether or not they've been subject to a series of complaints. So, no, I, I don't know is the answer to that one. Um, number two, um, during your, your speech about the uh, operations of the office, you said that the daughter travels to the office. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. So in my, in my understanding, the, the daughter of the, the applicants, a married couple, um, comes to work in that office multiple times a week. So, yeah. Thank you. So in condition two of the proposed granted planning permission it states only use the purpose of exam exonery to the enjoyment of residential use. So residential use, my, my understanding of this term and the conditions is that residential use is residents of the building. Therefore, would potentially an employee travelling over to the office not make it a home use, would it not make a commercial office? I mean, so the, the recommendation that's been reached here, it's a question of degree. So I suppose no one's arguing or no one's pretending otherwise that they're operating a business here. We're all fairly clear on that. My eyes are open as, as to that being what, what's being operated here. Um, the, the judgment that's been made here is essentially one of, of degree, if you like, or of intensity. Um, so the, the judgment is that a business use of a low, lower intensity um, within the parameters set out in, in 6.9, that paragraph, um, would be of a low enough intensity and low enough would cause few enough and um, yeah few enough amenity impacts upon neighbours that it would effectively fall under that definition of being ancillary to the use of the dwelling house um, or incidental to its enjoyment so w were, were that business used to be much more intense then there'd be a question as to whether that would fall outside that parameter so basically, the crux of it is normally this coming under permitted development, there wouldn't be a request a requirement for planning condition, obviously down to the, being a business and the levels and the intensity of the business. That's why it was seeing that here. It makes sense because potentially there could be traffic pressure increases, which is obviously a reason for refusal, ne negative effects on local communities, less parking, inconvenience, and not obviously detrimental effect on the character of the local area. So there would potentially be three breaches there. Um, so my question is, is how is it going to be monitored? Bear in mind they've got 20 employees. Domiciliary includes day and night palliative care, so travels of people through and day and the night to obviously look after those in need, which is a definite need, and that's, I applaud the people for doing that. However, how what's the monitoring policies for planning permission to be granted, but how will that level of business increase? There's nothing I can see in any of the conditions that would bring that back to a contravention of the planning application you're providing. How can you build in a condition that states that because otherwise what were you even sat here for because you could plant the, the the permission my understanding they could have 20 30 people turning up every day and there's no recall for anything in any of the documentation or the the, or the permission to grant that, that that brings that back to planning so how are you going to capture that so that, that would be the job of our enforcement officer so what, what we're doing this evening is determining the planning application and we have to do so based upon the information that's been provided in terms of what's proposed then were we to grant permission, the subsequent and sort of adjacent but not entirely related um, means by which that would be dealt with would be the planning, planning enforcement. So we employ a planning enforcement officer whose job it is to investigate. Yeah, thank you. F fully understand there's a planning enforcement officer that gets engaged should there be a, a contravention, but there is no boundary or no level to a contravention to enforce the planning. What, so what I'm saying is, is there's no threshold here. What, you need to have a threshold of some sort where it, where it triggers a planning enforcement. There is nothing. So just, just to clarify on that, the information within paragraph 6.9 was, um, so I, I, to, to paint the picture here, I emailed the applicants. I said, um, could you set out clearly to me the number of comings and goings associated with this business use that you're proposing in the application? So we're all, we're all aware that the application and the application site has been associated with quite an intensive number of vehicle movements in the past and, and perhaps currently. The way that I framed that question to them was, what are you proposing here in terms of the maximum number of vehicle movements? So that's all set out within paragraph 6.9. It's on page 98. It's on page 98. 6.9. Um, so that, that, that talks about the number of vehicle movements and comings and goings per day. That talks about per day 
per week, etc. Um, so, so that 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 is very deliberately sort of intended to be the trigger point, if you like. Can so, that then be set as a condition? Because without it being a condition, so it's not a condition. The the, the condition two is to, and, and that information ties into each other. So the application it's been adjudged by myself and fellow officers um, that. The, the business use that, that they are proposing would be of a low enough intensity that it would fall under that definition in the condition of being ancillary to the use of the dwelling house or incidental to its enjoyment. So that, that is the condition against which any future enforcement action would, would be triggered. So that, that's all been very deliberately um, laid out. And that's, a, I guess, a tried and tested... So that's a standard condition that we've used before. That's a tried and tested means by which, you know, of, of sort of essentially defining the terms of the permission. So like. just, just right, final thing, because this is very important. So I've gone to 6.9, and it says, the applicants have confirmed in writing that there'd be no more than two staff visits per week. Straight away, that's a contravention, because the daughter drives there every day. So that's what I'm saying. This doesn't. This is not valid. What you provided is not valid. I've just read that out. So what information you've given me to what stated it is not valid. It's not... As I see, it's not my job to question the veracity or the, you know, the, the truthfulness of what they're telling me they will do. It says so, it in writing here. So, so just to, to clarify, we're all on, on the same page that this site, this, this converted garage, has been associated with quite an intense business use in the past and at the moment. To be clear, what they are, we're, we're making a judgment on what they're proposing to do here. So we're not saying that everything that might have happened at the site previous to now is OK nor are we giving them carte blanche to do anything they want in the future. We're saying that a limited business use can, can take place. They have volunteered that information themselves. So in terms of us, whether or not the condition itself is feasible, they have volunteered that information. So they, they've done so under the premise that they would be happy to fall below those limits. Now, if they do, if we grant permission and they exceed those limits, then we can take enforcement action as necessary. But I think it's important here to make quite clear that distinction between the planning application we're judging, we're making a determination on, and any future enforcement action that might take place were they to breach that. We okay. can't let, you know, uh, the, you know the, the instinct that we have that they might breach that condition inform whether or not we, you know, grant planning permission. So, so next week, just say permission was granted, next week when the daughter turns up more than two days in a week, will the enforcement officer be coming out if they're notified by the local councillor? Yes, yeah, so the, job, the job of the enforcement officer is, is to take action as appropriate. So we have a we have a system by which that that happens. So, yeah, that, that's who's going to notify the daughter? Her days have gone from five to two. It's, it's not relevant to, to to determining the permission. Right, I've got Councillor Gravel's waiting to come in, um, and then I think we need to make some headway. Take spending quite a long time on this, and we've still got another big application. I can't quite um, follow on from the councillor's uh, uh, series of questions. I think they were really good. They're pretty frenzy. What's the um, backlog of uh, casework that the enforcement officer currently has? Chair, yeah, that's not relevant at all. We just need to be very careful that we're having a debate in within the scope of the application, because of course this is the the uh, the debate is being filmed, and uh, my job is to make sure that your decision making is decision making is entirely legally sound so i just had to jump in just to that point you, just to get it back on track but I, I, okay, well, I okay. hear that but i think it's a relevant question and i think whether or not it falls with the remit of what we're allowed to be told i suggest that it's a relevant question which would be interesting to know the answer to chair okay. i would just ad ad advise that that question isn't relevant to consideration of this application at this point. I'm just advising members that that's, that's the case. Question which hopefully is uh, relevant. So in the late information, Chair, which we were given today, um, it says the information, just reading from it, submitted by the applicants regarding the frequency uh, of staff visits, this is an important point, and the observations made by officers on site visits does not represent the full extent of movement at, to and, fro, at, to and from the site. So I'd just be grateful if the planning officer, and I hope this is relevant, could explain how many times our planning officers went out and did their observations as compared to the observations we've heard from the war councillors and members of the public. I think that would be interesting to compare the two, to see why there's this discrepancy and disconnect. Mm. So, um, just just to clarify the, the 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 wording that you're reciting in the late material, that that's the wording that you're reciting in the late material. That's my own 
um, summary of neighbour comments. So th that wording is reflects the neighbour comments that were received, not my own wording. Um, in terms of site visits, myself and the enforcement officer did one in February 2024, so two months ago. Um, this application has had a, a couple of case officers previously, um, each of which I believe, each of whom have, have visited the site. Um, again, I, I'm not strictly sure how relevant that is to the determination of the application, but I ha yeah, I have visited the site. Well, Quickly, um, I think it's relevant because there's a disconnect, isn't there? And I didn't quite, with respect, understand or hear properly. Apologies if my hearing aids aren't working properly. Um, the number, the amount of time and visits that you put in to do your observations, as opposed to the observations from the ward councillor and members of the public. How much time did, with, did the planning officers spend coming to the assessment of how much the usage was? That's really relevant. I don't think it's relevant, but to, to, to indulge you ever so slightly, the, the, po the point I've tried to make and the distinction I've tried to make is, you know, the neighbour comments received to date would suggest that there has been quite a lot of comings and goings from the site. What I would be doing by recommending approval in this application is not saying that an unlimited number of comings and goings from the site is acceptable. It's not giving them carte blanche to do as they please. The, the terms of, the, of any permission that we're granting are quite clearly set out. So there's a distinction distinction made between what we would be prepared to grant and the low intensity, low level business use that we would be satisfied counts as or comes under that ancillary definition. There's a difference between that and what we would be prepared to grant and, you know, the previous and perhaps current comings and goings from the site. To be very, very clear, what we are not saying is that that very intense use of the site with endless comings and goings in the past, we're not saying that that's all acceptable. Far, far from it. I just want to make that clear. Okay, thank you. I think it's really important that we are determining this application and not what may be happening at the site currently. And and that because because we have an application in front of us for the conversion of the garage, having the application um, in front of us with with the paragraph that the officer has got on here actually has might pin pin down the application site easier for enforcement action if, if in going forwards the the issue still exists because there will be a very there, there will be a much clearer route through to enforcement. I mean I suppose enforcement could happen at the moment just because they've done the conversion without the PD. It doesn't sound like enforcement's happened, but not particularly relevant. What we're really looking at is the change of use. It's, I mean we're getting caught up in in what's happening at the site, and that's not what we're here to determine. What we're looking at is, I, I think there's two issues, is, 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 is does the street scene match, and is it acceptable to change the garage into a habitable room? The, the use of the, the business, um, the, the, the occupiers have obviously given a, a, an indication of what is potential, what they, what, what they say they, they are going to do once they've got the permission. And it will be for the team to decide after the fact whether or not that's being complied with or not. What we're looking at is, is, is that acceptable, a low level enough use? And um, is it general, is the facade acceptable? And I'm hearing different views and I'm a bit, it's not the nicest, but I don't think we'd get away with saying that it's not in keeping. I mean, I, I think it would be a hard, hard battle to win it and appeal that one personally. Um, but I'd just like to hear what other people think and then we'll try and move on to a decision, please. Okay, in that case... Yeah, um, sorry, Jack. Um, I'm putting a lot of trust in um, the penultimate bullet on 6.9. This is the one that says um, there'll be uh, no more than two staff visits per week and no more than one per day and that there would never be two staff members on site at any one time. I'm putting a lot of trust in that, um, that that's accurate. So I I hear the concerns about um, how this is enforced. Um, if 
the committee is minded to pass this, and I would encourage the the residents to all residents to be very much aware of this um, commitment that's been made by the applicant, because it's um, it seems quite generous, it seems quite um, uh, very very acceptable um, um, if it's accurate. Thank you, Chair. I'm just going to add sort of a little to what you alluded to. Um, I think what we're faced with is something which is a matter of degree in uh, the, um, the effect that this will have um, on the residents. I mean, if this was a cul-de-sac of three houses and you were getting more visits um, it would be more serious and more effect. It's a cul-de-sac of 50 plus houses. Um, and I think that the assurance that we have had, as Councillor Brown has alluded to, um, does give a measure of confidence that the owners and the applicants realize that they do have an issue with their neighbors and I think that they also must realise that the neighbours, um, they have a responsibility to their neighbours not to cause any greater degree of inconvenience than is absolutely necessary. I mean, the issue is only of parking of cars. That can happen in any street, anywhere, at any time with people having a party with lots of different things going on. As far as the street scene is concerned, Yes, it's probably not an ideal um, layout, but is it awful? I don't think it is. Um, if it was bright red, something else, that would be painful, but it's white UVPC, which is, which is fairly common, obviously, um, in the location. So by a matter of degree, I cannot see there is anything that, I, that personally I feel would justify refusing this application as it stands. Page 96 says on now I say one, two, three, staff meetings take place within the quarters of the dwelling house and staff turn up regularly throughout the day. The converted guard functions on a base company manor dwelling, blah, blah. And you suggested that the people who use the garage as an office should find another premises. It's all, I'm not against you, I think you've got a good report together. And it, sometimes it contradicts one another. And when you start hearing people who speak, then your mind turns around. So we are saying in here, staff turn up regularly every day. I'm not, you know what I mean? Yes, I understand you, Councillor Tracy, you know, but so that's not what they're well, asking for. We're talking for. about the garage. Yes. But, you know, it's just, uh, but I mean, it's good report, it's good debate. And thank you. Okay, Councillor Tracy, turn your mic off. my mic off. Um, okay. Like Councillor Morgan, I, I, I don't think it, it's going to be turned, I don't think I could turn it down on SD4, the, the street, the inkeeping with the street. I, I, it's not the best. But I, it's it's not great, um, and and changing off the room to the with the as as Councillor Brown said, they, they they they've set out the parameters of which what they wish to use it for going forwards, and that seems acceptable. What it's been used for in the past isn't particularly relevant, and 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 therefore, I don't see that there's any reason not to accept the recommendations in the report. Um, so, on that basis, I suggest that we accept the recommendations laid out in the report. Do I have a seconder? Okay. Any All, debate? I don't get well, debate. we've had debate. I, I did put my hand up. If you, if, if you check the CCTV before, I put my hand up before these people, and I was left to last, and I kept on putting my hand up three or four times before you recognised it. So I was did put down for debate. We've had a proposal and a motion. It's a matter for you, Chair. Um, um, Councillor Chambers has indicated that he uh, raised his hand. Okay, Councillor Chambers, you can make some debate. And... 
I think we're forgetting the principles of possibilities of reasons why to object. If you look at national guidelines, there's sort of seven main reasons, and three of them are traffic pressures, negative effects on local amenities, traffic congestion, less parking, and detriment, uh, detrimental effects on the capital local area. Straight away, you can see that's been converted. It doesn't look anything like the other properties. And like I said, there's been six conversions in the area. Five of them have obtained no um, objections from anyone in the street. Yet this one has received 10 letters of objection, yeah? That should be 50 objections on the streets for every other, well, sorry, 60 objections if all the others have the same objection. Not only that, the local town parish council have objected significantly, not with one letter, not with two, but with three letters. So if you're on the street and you're dealing with these pressures and these concerns, I'm sure you'd all be thinking very differently to the way of that. And you're saying, oh, it's just a conversion of a garage. No, it's a conversion from a residential auxiliary garage to a business premises that employs 20 employees. Please, please don't interrupt me, uh, Councillor Morgan. It's very rude. Not only that, that there's um, very con contradictive things. I was told by the officers that section page 98, um, bullet points nine, uh, 6.9, was what the criteria is being set on where you would enforce against. <laughs> Yet it says there'd be no more than two visits in a week from staff. The daughter turns up to the business premises every day. That's five, so straight away it's in breach. Also, it says there never be more than two members of staff at the premises. But it says, uh, but, and then it says otherwise times there'd be at least two or three. So the information you provided is con contradictory. So what we're here deciding today is planning permission for a business premises in a residential street, not for conversion of a garage to a residential building. Please let's remember what we're here for. And that's what it is. Because if it was that, you know what? There's planning permissions that let it go through immediately. It's called permitted development. So if we're converting this into a bedroom for uh, an elderly family member, etc., it wouldn't even be here in planning because it's called permitted development when it goes through automatically. The reason this is here is purely for the fact that there's 20 employees, there's significant issues with uh, the parking, and it just shows here with the people here today, obviously it's causing an issue in, in the, the local community, in the local area. Would you want that in your street if you're a neighbour? Would you want an increase in traffic pressures? Would you want the negative effect on local amenities? Would you want the detrimental effect on character in the local area? No, you wouldn't. And these people have took the time to write 10 letters, attend the meeting today because they're concerned. But they haven't done that with five of the other six. The reason for that is, is because they're not business premises. They haven't got 20 employees coming in and out day and night because it's domiciliary care that requires daily visits to people's care homes. And also I'm aware of very many uh, care companies, but I'm not going to list in the area, that do carry out palliative and domiciliary care. They often need bibs, gloves, protective equipment, aids for um, passing on the palliative. It's people will be turning up every day. So if this is granted, all we're going to be doing is costing the enforcement officer several hours in time, probably even hundreds and hundreds of pounds in their time, to go out and enforce in this next week. Because straight away, what you provided here in 9.6 uh, 9 is in itself is contradiction to what the information you provide that they do already, and that's, it's, it's ludicrous, really. And then we're told that, oh, it's fine, it should go through, we recommend it goes through. But then condition two doesn't state if it goes over so many visits, we're going to be doing X, Y, and Z. It's, there's no teeth in this at all. It's, it's just, oh, let it go through, not our problem. Um, we don't really care, it should just go through anyway. Well, I'm sorry, it's a plastic, hideous front entrance. If it was a plastic window, matching the street scene with brickwork, then I'd say, yes, I agree with it. But this, there's no way you can do that. And just on a final note, um, Councillor Morgan, and your behaviour has been very, very unprofessional, banging the table and interrupting. I, I don't approve it at all. Thank you very much. Right, look, no. hold on. We're going to the vote. Uh, Chair, can I, before, can yeah. I just clarify some things that were factually incorrect? Do you uh, have to put your light, mic? Thank you, Chair. So you, you've heard from the officers that permitted development rights have been removed for the property, so it, it couldn't go through as, as, uh, on that basis. Secondly, the application before you is not for a business use. The application before you is for a habitable use of a garage. That's controlled by that being ancillary to the use of a home. 
if that intensifies, that condition two addresses that and enables that to be enforced. Those are the matters that are before you factually. Thank you, Chair. So I move that we accept the recommendations as laid out in the report. Perhaps I was second. Second. All those in favour? Yeah. One, two, three, four, five, six in favour. All those against? One, two, three, four, five. Five. Was there any abstentions? I don't think so. No. no. Okay, so that's carried. Right, five minute break to go to the bathroom. No more than five minutes because we need to move.
Okay, welcome back. So let's take application item number five now. So Adam, whenever you're ready. Thank you. Uh, members who were here at last month's meeting will have seen the application before, but I, I will go through the slides again. I note that there are some members who wouldn't have seen it, so um, I, I'll go through them slightly more quickly than last time, but please ask and I'll pause on any of the slides or go back to them if, if you need to see them again. So the application is for uh, the redevelopment of the former Sainsbury's retail unit for 55 flats. Um, aerial shot of the site from above, um, Hare Lane on this side, Northgate Street here, and the Hare Lane car park on this side. Uh, different view showing Northgate Street uh, on the bottom side of the slide. Uh, the Northgate Street um, side of the site as present, the Hare Lane side. Uh, that's the existing uh, elevation, so in effect the, the red shaded building would be the part that would be demolished. The proposed ground floor, so you have a block here replacing the Northgate Street frontage with a commercial Class E unit here, uh, a new uh, five-storey building in the back, a courtyard for resident use in the middle, uh, and a new block in place of the hair lane frontage in this position here. <clears throat> the first floor plan uh, showing the flats, the colours are just to denote the different size of units. Uh, and again, the next floor above, so you're starting to see on the hair lane and the Northgate Street elevations where the building is cut back slightly from the frontage. Uh, the green is the roof of that block with solar panels. And then the tallest building at the back, um, shown here. This is the proposed elevation to Northgate Street. And the rear of that block, proposed elevation to Hare Lane. And the rear of that block, proposed block A, which is the large one at the back of the site front and rear and side, uh, street scene context for Northgate Street, the detailing plan that the applicants provided for the Northgate Street block, the Hare Lane street scene, and the detailing for that block, the block A detailing the, the building at the back, um, contextual photos for Northgate Street, and for Hare Lane, this is the view looking from the Hare Lane car park towards the site. That's the existing block. So block A, the tall block, would appear roughly in this position. And the Hare Lane block would appear behind the Raven Centre, which is the listed building that was discussed last time in the position here. Uh, this is the former delivery area for the retail store. This is the, uh, or one of the few main new additions to the plan since members saw it at the last meeting. So this is a series of plans. There's some enlarged versions of these in a moment, which I'll come on to, but they've been submitted by the applicant. So there, there are no changes to the proposed design. This is visualizations of the design um, as originally conceived or, or amended, but originally seen by members at last the last meeting. So what I understand these are showing are different cladding options um, for the building. Um, three of them here, which I'll come on to on the, the enlarged slides in a minute. Obviously, that is the equivalent view of the existing building. So the first option, I understand that that is proposing a generally beige coloured cladding with uh, a vertical arrangement uh, with projecting fins. That is a similar colour, but in a horizontal flat cladding. And that is, um, I assume, LED's the, the colour indication the applicants have given, again, with a vertical fin arrangement. So that's, that's the main new information that the applicants provided. 
Um, this was the mural mentioned in the report as existing on the side of the building um, and the massing comparisons that we saw last time. So the pink is the existing, the green is the proposed. And you'll recall there was a series of model views to try and show that visual impact of the building. So north, um, in each instance, you'll have on the left, the pink, the existing, green on the right, the proposed, Northgate Street, looking down Northgate Street from the direction of the cross, uh, in the opposite direction, again, slightly further down um, from the cross, but looking in that direction uh, from Hare Lane, uh, Hare Lane across the opposite side of the road off the green, Pitt Street, uh, this is looking from the Hair Lane car park, Pitt Street farther back. Uh, this is looking from the Hair Lane car park, cranked round a bit next to the access road. Um, this is looking from the end of Spread Eagle Road and closer in on that view, closer towards the bottom of Worcester Street. This is looking across the King School playing field. That is the building in there and in there. Uh, this is the model view from Hare Lane North. As I mentioned last time, I think that that view would probably actually be screened by Tanners Hall, which is now existing in the foreground. Uh, and again, some more massing comparisons with the pink as the existing, the green as the proposed. Um, this is a, a, a massing of block A that I asked for just as a sort of sense check on um, the visualizations to show that it would in fact be behind that foreground building at the Northgate Street, Worcester Street junction. Uh, and this is the model view from the new street in the forum. Um, again, uh, the two options are um, different levels above ground. Last time we were talking about where exactly that building was shown. So just to the right of where the laser pointer is in the higher view, you can start to see the top of the building appearing. So a brief update in the report um, and obviously happy to take any questions. Thank you. Okay, I've got a speaker, Will Collins. It's the same as last time, you've got up to five minutes. Do you, do you want a one minute warning or are you okay? Yeah. Uh, good evening, Chairman and members of the committee. I'm here today to represent the applicant, Clare House Developments Limited. Um, the applicant would like to thank members for their comments at March's committee, and I'll now address each of the four main issues that were raised at that committee as follows. Firstly, in regard to the Hare Lane elevation design, some concern was raised in regard to its design, colour scheme and similarity to the existing Sainsbury store. The visualisations provided as late material, which you've just seen, uh, show three potential options of cladding and colours for the upper floor. The visualisations show that the design and colours proposed would not be similar to the existing building. The use of dark grey and light coloured bricks offers a more muted palette of materials than the existing red brick. This reflects the calmer and more tranquil character of this part of the city. It also provides a palette of materials in keeping with um, existing built form, including the black and white uh, timber framing of the two listed buildings um, either side of the Hare Lane elevation. Uh, the brickwork will also be interspersed with high quality textured brick detailing. A lighter coloured metal cladding is proposed to the setback um, top floor, which you saw of the Hare Lane frontage, further minimising the presence of this upper floor in views. Overall, the replacement of the existing built form with the proposed building represents a clear beneficial effect in the quality form and character of the streetscape. The second issue raised was with regards to the potential for highway safety improvements to Pitt Street. Um, the applicant sympathises, of course, with King School in respect to this matter. However, planning law is very clear that planning obligations, such as the provision of items um, necessary to make the development acceptable in planning terms, and are directly related to the development. As this is uh, an existing problem as well, 
Um, the proposed change of the use of the site from town centre, supermarket to residential would result in a significant reduction in vehicle movements. It's not considered necessary or reasonable for the applicant to provide any mitigation measures because of that. The applicant considers the third issue raised regards provision of further on-site parking. However, given the highly sustainable city centre location and likely impact on viability of the scheme, it was not considered appropriate to invest investigate this matter any further. Um, the application is accompanied by a travel plan, which sets out how residents will be able to travel daily without use of a car, as well as measures to ensure residents do not own cars through the use of marketing and sales information. The final issue raised uh, was regarding the proposed building's relationship with the Raven Centre. This matter is covered by both the Party Wall Act and the Planning Listed Building and Conservation Areas Act. It's understood that the two buildings are not tied or connected and therefore the removal of the existing building would not require listed building consent. Prior to demolition, the Party Wall Act would however kick in and the owners of the Raven Centre would be able to request independent structural surveyor reports from the applicant to ensure the integrity of the listed building is retained. The applicant's intention is that the new building would not be tied or connected to the Raven Centre and as such listed building consent again would not be required. The Party Wall Act would however again be applicable and ensure that the structural integrity of all buildings was preserved. With these matters addressed I'd like to reiterate the significant public benefits of the scheme um, which include the provision of 55 new homes and a policy compliant provision of 11 affordable homes located in a highly sustainable city centre location on brownfield land. Approximately 80 occupants who will all contribute to the local economy and assist in supporting ship, uh, shops, services and facilities locally. An underused premises that does not make a positive contribution to the vitality and viability of the city centre would be removed. A reduction in overall footprint of bill form on the site. The site's currently 100% brownfield and the proposal would introduce green landscape open space in the heart of the city centre. And the replacement of an efficient, inefficient building with up-to-date ones that meet modern building regulation standards. Finally, the proposal would result in a number of significant, significant economic benefits, including a sill payment of approximately £230,000, other financial contributions such as open space, education, libraries and Cotswold Beechwoods secured by Section 106 agreement, totalling over half a million pounds, plus future council tax payments from residents. There would also be a significant job creation during the approximate 30-month construction period, estimated at over 60 workers minimum over the duration of the build. I hope members can support the applicant's proposals this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so open to member for questions, first of all, and then we'll go into debate. Anybody? Uh, Councillor D, and then Councillor Tracy. I'm looking at the, um, the, the picture that was in late material of the frontage of Hare Lane, and it appears that the lower story is made of brick. Is the material brick or is it something else? I understand that that's brick. And what colour is it? Beige? White? So the visual that you have in front of you is probably the best indication of the colour that we've had. On the plans, I think it indicates a sort of silvery grey mm. brick. Now, normally what we would have, and indeed in this case I've recommended it as we normally do, is a condition to sign off the actual specific brick product. So typically the plans would show a material and perhaps a broad description, red, orange, typically might be for Gloucester. Um, and then the applicant, if they get planning permission, they proceed with it, would source an actual brick and often send us a sample. And so we would know that the manufacturer and the actual product, and then we would sign that off. So at the moment, to assist members, what you've got is it's going to be brick. It's suggested it's going to be silvery grey, and we've got the coloured visuals. The actual brick product, as normal, would be approved under a condition, so we know precisely what it is. I see. Often you get issues around... Uh, lead-in times for materials so 
you know, if someone said a brick product now and then they built it in six months time, suddenly there might be a, a year leading to get that product. So normally it's sensible to build in some flexibility around the exact product. And the hope is that, that the, co the colour of that product would match or be in keeping with the 16th century buildings either side of it, if possible. That, that would be one design approach, yeah. Um, it, one supposes that if and when the applicant makes that submission, they'll provide some sort of justification from their architect. Uh, I would consult the conservation officer typically on that if that was considered the appropriate design response. Yes, it might be chosen to match it. Um, it, it kind of depends on what, what the sort of aesthetic is that you're going for. Sometimes someone might say, well, actually, the appropriate response here is to make it look overtly modern and therefore we'll go for a different material type. Um, obviously, if, if members are wanting to give an indication of that, I guess that's open for you to do. Um, but yes, that could be a valid design response, I agree with you. Uh, and follow up, um, there's quite a lot of metal ra ra railings visible. Um, perhaps the colour of those could also um, mirror the colours in the buildings either side. So rather than be grey, perhaps um, black, or oh, I haven't seen these, um, these old buildings recently. Are they still black or are they brown? <laughs> the, the beam. Yeah, they're, they're, they're still like that. I think that's probably using the photograph in the bottom right to just transpose onto the visual. So it's, I, I think that's pretty faithful. So there would be some flexibility as to the colour of the railings? So again, that would be something we could pick up under condition. Yeah, we typically ask for details of all the, the main facing materials. I'm sorry to labour the chair, Good if I may, just one more thing. The, the top elevation, the top story, that the colour suggested, there are only slight improvements on the last slides we had, colour-wise. Is there any, if we're not happy with that, is there any flexibility on that? We're, we're looking at beige, aren't we, and grey? Mm -hmm. If the committee preferred another colour, more in keeping with the roofs on the 16th <coughs> century building, would that be possible? Sorry, I was just looking at how exactly I'd set out the condition. But I think the uh, the answer to that is possibly, it, without knowing the exact products that are out there, I wouldn't know what the colour range is. Um, one supposes that there will be more than beige or lead colour. I think that's a reasonable assumption. Um, but it's a bit difficult for me to advise you with any clarity, I'm afraid, what the other options would be, because they might pick, you know, one of several cladding types and one of several colour ranges within it. Um, what, what's that made of, that cladding that we can see there in the pictures? Again, that's that's not clear. I mean, it, it, it could be a metal, it could be a, a, a sort of a, a different material that looks like a metal, you know. Um, it, it, it could be one of an, any number of different types of cladding. Okay. Um, before I bring in Councillor Tracy, just out of curiosity, out of the, the three sort of suggested designs that came through, if we've got them here, um, maybe maybe during debate, if you could just let, let us know which ones you like the best or whether you you're more like what Councillor D was saying, so that the officer and the agent have a steer as to what, what might be 
the most suitable. Um, Councillor Tracy, do you got some questions? I've got them. We'll just pop them down. <laughs> I have got cladding down, and uh, and I like the idea of the beige, and it's got to be in keeping because it's very it's dark crown there, and we have a lot of visitors coming to the cathedral. Am I right in thinking this is like a similar building in Southgate Street? Is it the same developer? They seem all very, very, very familiar. Yeah, right. So, go on, sorry. I, I don't know, I'm afraid. Yeah, well, that's the same um, structure as the face Gloucester Keys. But yeah, so, um, yeah, with, I'll, I'll, I'll carry on from there. Yeah, it would be nice. I'd love to see a feature of the black and white like the Raven Centre. Uh, to blend in, in, that would be really nice. And this would be something good for the city if this development could prove it. It'd be, you know, well worth looking at because we've got the Bishop's House just over the palace, over the road. We've got a lot of things going on around there, so they really need to get it right. Um, now, it's 55 plats, is that right? And they're mixed. And am I, sorry, am I right in thinking, can children live in there? I think it's highly likely that that would be possible. I, I couldn't say we wouldn't have any control over that, but I think it's yeah. it's quite possible. Um, I mean, the 11 uh, affordable housing units would, I, I guess, just be allocated in accordance yeah. with the usual system. and they Especially well with the King's School, because people would buy those for their children to go to the King's School. I, I'm going to go down and list it. Raven Centre, um, I'm going backwards and forwards here, but the Raven Centre... It's a very historic building in this city. It's very, very, very well used. And um, I've just got a little concern there, not probably facing down Pitt Street, but on the side of it. And I'm always dealing, and you're only as good as your officers, uh, and we always have a lot of rubbish dumped there at the back of the Raven Census. So I think they really got to think, these developers, on where they put their waste. And I'd like to see it being, um, you know, in the big bins surrounded. And they'd have to work with the Raven Centre because we have loads of stuff being cleared from there. OK, so I'd like to see that. And, and then, am I right in thinking, I mean, it's all right saying bikes and all that. They don't use the blooming bikes. But that car park, I'm not sure if it belongs to us. Does this, that car park anything belongs to us, doesn't it? So would we, uh, we've, are we going to give the developers a place to park cars there? A section, would they buy that office or would that come in with Thamesbury's? That isn't part of the proposal, whether yeah. the council would make a separate property transaction, you know, Brilliant. separate to this application. Obviously, I couldn't say that wouldn't be my, my place to say yeah, one way because... or the other, but it's not part of... What's being proposed? No, because that would be time. the entrance where they took all the deliveries, and also was a lot of disabled places there. And uh, so, I mean, we, you know, they could buy a little bit of land off us, but the rubbish there is diabolical. So we need to do a really good landscape of bins, whatever. Um, and and we got also got to have like a lot of buildings, like King's Quarter now where we can see our wonderful cathedral, and that comes in the planning, doesn't it? Because the cathedral will be seen from all directions. Because you can even see uh, from King's own way, the cathedral. So it will hopefully not be that high. I hope I'm not giving too many questions. <laughs> uh, but you've got to get this right, because this could be a building for the earth. And am I right in thinking that there is a grass area for the tenants? Yeah, inside like a square, like a Spanish courtyard. Great. And am I right in thinking there'd be no washing lines or rotary things? So all that would have to be done inside the building. I don't know whether that would be the case. I don't think that would fall within our control. It no. might be something that the management company yeah. would want to dictate. Well, I, mean, I went to a viewing of a, a property just been built, and I won't say where, and it was very nice, but well, I, I know I should go into debate with this, but the unfortunate thing is, they all, I wish I want to go and buy them all neck curtains, 
But in there, they had um, all washing hanging over the windows and everything. But I know that's going into debate. But where I'm coming from, would these, these flats be filled with washing facilities and dryers and things like that, please? Because it isn't a really... No. Not relevant. Not relevant? Well, I hope they don't get damp then. And the cladded, yeah, keep brickwork. We, I know it should be there, but I'm just going to say it. Uh, I might not be here next month, but what I'm saying is, uh, I'm not telling you to suck eggs. When we used to do planning, we used to have the people bring the bricks along, like, you know, you're spot on there. Um, and they used to bring everything, and we chose, you know, the planning, what they thought would be relevant with the city centre or where these houses were going to be built. I'm just, you know, so that perhaps could out next time. And, uh, I, I know, my, my, um, the Raven Centre, I really want to protect that, and I'd really like to see that in keep him. And um, I'll let that go for a minute, but I think that's quite, quite a few questions there, isn't it? <laughs> highways, in a way, a question for the highways, is, am I right in thinking that uh, it is 20 miles prior there, isn't it? But we're um, down Air Lane. Am I right in thinking that? Mr. Highway man. Yeah? I, I think that that's right. I think it goes to 30 yeah. beyond the mini random. I've always been inundated with the King's School and highways for putting that for 20 miles along that road there. But you've covered it all in, in the, you know, the paperwork spot on. Uh, but it would be C nice because the children, they, you know, well, it needs slowing up there. I I um I think I'll leave it like that. I think I've covered a bit of debate in this as well. Okay. But it is it is it, it looks a nice building. If we can get the colours right, the structures right, and not having it too high, and especially the rubbish when we have visiting bishops coming to see us. Thank you, you for that. But thank you for a good report. Anybody else got any questions? Uh, yeah, Councillor Conda and then Councillor Chief. Um, we talked about traffic movement. Can um, a stipulation be put in that no large vehicles go along Pitt Street? Um, they've only just rebuilt part of the ancient wall on the outskirts of the Cathedral Close. And um, I think with the proximity of Hare Lane to the site, there's no need for large vehicles to go along Pitt Street at all. Unfortunately, I'd probably have to go along the building. Tracy, you might... Thank you. Can I just clarify, is that in relation to the construction phase? Yeah. yeah. So condition 46 is a fairly standard condition that we put on a lot of the bigger schemes where you have a construction management plan for highways and, and one of those elements or several of them include advisory routes for construction traffic um, and, and, and the like. So we, we could pick that up in liaison with the highway authority at, at that time. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, if you turn to 4.0 on recommendation of Planning Development Manager. Yeah, let me know when you're there. Um, if you go to um, Block A, North and South Elevation. Um, drawing reference number 19.077 backslash 57. No revision. Correct? Revision star. Yeah. Um, if you go on to the planning portal, approve documents for planning, and you turn on to that document 19.077 backslash 57, that's the block A revision. 
north and south elevation. You on that on the planning portal? Okay. There's different drawings on the planning portal to the ones you're approving. So it's what we're approving is not up to date with the drawings on the planning portal. So you're asking us to recommend drawings that aren't up to date with what you have and you put through on planning and planning for uh, that's gone out to the public. So it's uh, an invalid planning document you're putting forward to us today. It's not possible for me to come in on that without without. It's very important it. to check it because the documents you put online, which went out to public consultation for people to review in the public domain, are very different to the ones you put on for us to uh, vote through on planning committee. If you check, it'd be very imperative if you check the council planning documentation portal and the reference number, um, and then and, and view what I'm saying. So it's imperative really because otherwise we're approving documents that aren't that uh, uh, void by two revisions. There's been a revision A and a revision B. Please, can, you, can you check that? Because I'm pretty sure I'm not mistaken. And it's very important because we're going to pass planning that's not that's not up to date. Th thanks for raising it. Um, if it's wrong, we can we can look at that. Um, Jordy, we should check that now because otherwise we're. Chair, that would ordinarily be delegated down to the planning officer. Yeah, but. So, the planning officer is not access to it now. Okay. I'll to the planning officer. That'll be my, my advice. What my concerns are is you've been showing us a series of documentation which is, which is null and void because. Yeah, it's very important. So, are we going to vote on stuff that's irrelevant? They're, they're null and void. Yeah, well, I can't vote on something that's. It's a matter of well, how can we all vote on something that's been, not been put forward to us? This is obviously a legal requirement. Okay, I'd like to make note of this uh, legal point that um, drawings that have gone out to public consultation okay, let's are different to what we've been on. planning. And, and it's, it, can that's we note that, please, in the minutes? No, I've, I've raised that formally. Okay. Yeah. Any more questions? Do you want Cancel. to come back? Or do you want to say something? Well, only that if the <coughs> councillor wants to clarify what he's saying is different. Councillor Gravels, have you got some questions? Or you... yeah, um, I didn't understand the answers that you were giving to Councillor Chambers. So I'll just well, so just before you jump in, so just through you to uh, Councillor Chambers. Is he saying that there's a different set of documents on the public portal than the documents we've got here this evening? Is that the gist of it? That, that's correct. Um, what I've noticed on the council um, documentation that goes out to the public where they can comment on is two revisions ahead of what we're looking at. So the public are looking at different things to us. We're looking dated drawings that are null and void. And the developers put forward under their design and build scheme uh, further revision A, and they've even progressed it there since, and they've gone to a revision B, and I've double checked that live with the council. So I think it's very relevant. We're we're voting on drawings that aren't up to date, and it's unfair to the public. It's not that the plans themselves are before the the committee today. Reference to a plan, and that reference refers to a revision number, and what councillor. Um, uh, Chambers has stated is that uh, the report refers to an old revision number. So if Councillor Chambers can um, uh, state clearly what that is, then at least it allows our officers to go back and make their amendment. So it's not that you've been asked a different plan, it's a revision number. It's a typographical error in the document. Uh, on, on the contrary, I'm sorry. Um, I'd like to raise this. No, please, please, it's very important. I'd like to raise this. Condition two states, the conditions that we're meant to be agreeing on, states, yeah, this is what we're voting on today, states, the development hereby permitted shall be carried out in accordance with the drawings on the following plans, except where otherwise required by conditions on this permission. It states the list of drawings. I only went through two, and straight away I noticed that we're two revisions behind. So we're voting on these set drawings that are, have already been superseded by two revisions. We should be issued and be presented with the current drawings, not ones that have been two, two revisions. That's quite a lot. That's a significant amount of revisions. And this obviously is a default and defunct uh, committee okay, on that basis. Let's get the 
Chair, Thank question. you, Chair, through you, Chair. Chair, it's normal for conditions uh, to be delegated to the, the case officer, perhaps in consultation with the Chair. And may I suggest that uh, Councillor Chambers has indicated what he sees as a discrepancy, that that is checked by the case officer and delegated down to the case officer in consultation with you, Chair, so that the correct revision, we can ensure the correct revision is referred to in the condition. Thank you, Chair. Okay. I'm happy for that. Um, do you want to come? Yeah, sorry. If I could just um, just add, just for uh, clarity, just to help um, Councillor Chambers and, and to help the members, there, there, were, there were a thorough list um, of, uh, of slides that showed um, the, a whole set of, uh, of drawings. Now, the m members have all been party to viewing the same drawings, and so they can vote. It, uh, it, in a legally sound context on the basis of voting for exactly the same drawing set. Now, we can then have delegated authority, if you choose so, to then look over and make sure that the plans listed in condition two are akin to the plans that are before you at the moment. Um, but I just wanted to make it absolutely clear that the plans that you've been viewing on the case officer's slides are collectively the plans that you've all seen and collect co collectively represent the application that's before you. So there's no ambiguity there in that context, just to assist. Thank you for assisting. That's However, helpful. I'm on the current drawings, which are the real drawings, and the drawings we're looking at, the balconies have changed substantially. There's not an overhang on the window, and the windows are continual between two floors. So it is quite a significant changes that are in the public domain that the public would have based their letters, based their uh, positive comments or negative comments on, and they've been able to assess. Yet we're looking at drawings that are significantly different. You can just see there, the balconies compared to the balconies here. And look at the top windows here. And then also, even on the top floor, it doesn't even have a, um, a shading canopy. And then also, across, across here, the top floor, this one's missing the shading canopy, while that one has. So what I'm saying is, is it is significantly different from what we're voting on. Are we Are voting on what the public have looked at? Are we looking at, we're voting on stuff that's three revisions short? Right. It's schoolboy errors, and it shouldn't be at this stage in planning committee. It's not, it's not acceptable. I think the, the, what the officer has said here is the, the draw, they will check that the, that the drawing numbers on the decision that is given once it has been because we're this is we're um, delegating this aren't we Let, let's see the changes balcony windows top floor significant changes let's, let's see them yeah let's discuss them I'm just okay, saying, how just, can we, how we just vote and discuss and delegate time out for five minutes right. to let the case officer have a, yeah. che a check with...
Okay, welcome back. Um, the officer's just going to explain about the plan numbers. So the position that we've reached is that the plans that I've been showing to you are the up-to-date plans. The issue that I think has caused the concern is the way that um, the architect has labelled the revisions. So you have a revision A, you have a revision B, which my understanding is that's what the councillor identified, which is a superseded plan. The current one has been called revision asterisk. It may be thought of that that should have been called revision C. It happens to have been called revision asterisk. So there's no error. You haven't seen anything that's out of order or inconsistent. What, what I can do, and we do this quite often anyway, is just for the avoidance of doubt, and if it's helpful for peace yeah. of mind, is put after the plan received by the local planning authority on date X. We do that a lot. It's pretty standard. And that would then differentiate it in a second manner from any other version of that plan, yeah. if that's acceptable to members. I, I think that's just sensible. OK. I, um, any more questions? No? Oh, yeah, Councillor Hyman. It's only a quick one. The police were concerned about designing out crime, and I was just wondering, because I can't see it here, uh, what arrangements have been made, and if there are any further comments from the police. I'm just checking my report. I, I think I know the situation with their comments, but I'm just going to double check before I answer you. Yeah, so the police didn't make any further comments on the revised proposal, so there's nothing extra. Um, in, in terms of addressing those issues, I don't think there's anything to add to what I included in the original report about addressing those issues. We feel that they're covered to an acceptable degree. Any more questions? No. Okay. So on behalf of all of us, thank you so much. Thank you, Council Chambers, and also for the panel officers for taking time and our solicitor to sort it out. And that's what I could call a good planning committee. Thank you all. Just yeah, thank you, Councillor Tracy. Um, we'll move to debate. Um, a question or debate? Okay. Question. I've got to make it a fun new ask. Planning meeting. Um, what I was going to say, um, so cycling sheds. So what's the permit? What's the um, allowance for cycles for the development cycle storage? Seventy-eight spaces. In addition, the plans show a space within the flat that could accommodate it. But principally, we would base that on the number of cycles accommodated in a bespoke shelter. In this case, in the buildings. Sorry, thank you. You've got you've got one here for block C, one here, and one here. And up, David Brown. Um, yes, thank you, Chair. Can we just go over again what influence the planning committee can have on the design? We've got um, uh, we've got beige, we've got light beige, we've got slate grey. We haven't actually got black and white, which is sort of what I was expecting to come back to fit in with or, or to blend in with um, the uh, Raven Centre. Thank you, Councillor Brown. I think you're on the same page as Councillor D there then. Um, so do you want to just reiterate what we can do? I suppose the agents in the room and you're here and you're hearing it and you, that uh, black and white might be a that might might be a nicer colour scheme. Um, I would like to hear from other members because obviously that's two that have said that and um, maybe we'll just can we run maybe we'll just run around the room talking about the designs now um, indications over there so Condor and then um, um, Ken. Thank you, Chair. Um, we, we've talked about local style. I've said in previous meetings, I'm not sure what local style is, but 
Um, in this situation, I think we should be looking at the roof line because when we see designs presented to us face on, we see the squareness of the building. But when you approach this site, whether you're coming from the cathedral up Pitt Street or through St Lucy's Garden or diagonally across the car park, you see it at an oblique angle. And what you see then is you see oblique lines, you see the gables of the older buildings, you see the uh, timbers of the Raven Centre and you see um, dormer windows which are triangular in shape. Um, so I, I find that the roof line is unsatisfactory because it's still really a block. It's got one change of height in it when I think it should have a little bit more variety because the, the street scene in a medieval town or city is made of separate units which have built, been built separately and this is too uniform. Secondly, when I first saw the design, uh, the revised design, I thought it was going to be white render, which I was happy with. But I hear now that it's white brick. White brick is not local. The colour that we would be expecting to see from, from brick is the red that we see in the Abbey pub on the other side of the road, um, near the Northgate Junction, or the red tiles on the roof of the Raven Centre. And so I think I would be happier if I saw more variety um, and a little bit of the oblique styling um, and a breakup of the roof line um, so that it looks a little bit um, differentiated rather than very uniform. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I see what uh, uh, Councillor Condo means about the gables. It would be nice, obviously, in an ideal world for everything to be uniform, but obviously it is the modern style and we've been asked to give an opinion on the cladding. Um, I go along entirely with what Councillor Dee was saying about the, the colour. It, it would be nice if it was a sort of terracotta to sort of match in with the the tiled roof of the Raven Centre. But I think looking at the ones we've been given, I, I was quite surprised myself looking at them. I thought the um, the beige or the lighter tones would, would blend in better. But actually, in my own personal opinion, I think the grey picks up the colours of the timbers on the front of the Raven Centre. And so actually, of those three that we're being asked to make a choice on, my personal preference would be for the grey. Thank you, Chair. And you would I've got Councillor Tracy and then Councillor D. Uh, ...to have like corner arch sort of, uh, like to incline with the, the uh, cathedral, a, a little arch type of thing on the roof. But you are spot on. I'm disappointed that the applicant has decided not to amend the design of the hair lane frontage. The design of the facade does not fit in with the character of the street scene. The Civic Trust said that it's not in keeping with the adjacent buildings and lacks imagination and we're missing an opportunity. Historic England said the frontage of Hare Lane fails to make a positive response to the setting. The scheme does not enhance the character and appearance of the conservation area. The proposal should conserve and enhance the character and the appearance and the architectural quality of the area and the wider setting in terms of sighting, scale, form, proportion, and design and materials. And I'm quoting the city plan policy D1. It looks, the, the top story looks like ship containers, containers you would find on a ship. They look as if they've just been plonked on top. And I don't like the look of them. And I think that perhaps they could be changed. I, I'm not happy at all with the, um, with the proposals of that hair lane. 
frontage. Okay, anybody else? Debate? Um, I think it's really um, good development from what I've seen. Um, I think that things shouldn't contrast, uh, things should contrast differently with the old. Um, we're not in the 16th century, the Tudor buildings anymore, and developments have changed from sort of St. Anne's to Victorian to George, Georgian to Victorian. Things always change and develop, and I think it suits quite well the old with the new. Um, I think that looks quite nice. I like the balustrading. I like that they've gone away and looked at more cycling. They've uh, looked at points we made last time. Um, I think if it was black and white, it looked absolutely horrendous, like a zebra. Um, but yeah, no, I think I think it's really good. I think the developers and the architects have done a good design. And where previously I was a little bit more hesitant to support it, I think that we need some, we need this type of housing in our city. There's a shortfall on housing, especially for singles and couples. There's 5,000 housing waiting lists in our city. Um, and I think this is going to go well towards complementing that and helping reduce people that are currently in bed and breakfasts and temporary and supported living to actually get their foot on the housing ladder. And I think it's a great space for the um, student accommodation um, that's needed whether the students are going to stay there or, or a stepping stone for students that have come to university here and looking to stay in the city and build their career and build a career here. So I think it's really, really good. That building's been there far too long, long being an eyesore. Anything that looks better than that 1970s concrete um, bomb shelter would be brilliant. And I think it's really fantastic that they're utilising the old um, uh decorations that are put on there so uh i'm i'm going to support this i think it's fantastic and i'm really happy people are spending the money and developing our city thank you okay um i anybody else no I'll, I'll just yeah Let, let's councillor gravels because he's not coming and you've said quite a lot so, councillor. so you've had um, a lot of suggestions around the room and i'm not sure how the offices are going to bring all those together because there doesn't seem to be huge agreement on, on each one of them uh, i like the idea that david was talking about about the black and white i think that contrasts uh, well with the surrounding buildings um i won't repeat what i said at the last planning committee when i was saying that i think that making this uh, car free uh, development is a recipe for just storing up trouble uh, in the future. We've had that debate. I didn't get anywhere with it, um, but I certainly have got reservations on that. Uh, I welcome the point about the affordable housing. made that point before. So, you know, the, the wise guys here at the end of the table are going to have to decide how they bring all these different suggestions together. I look forward to hearing what they come up with. Thanks. OK, thank you, Councillor Gravels. Councillor Tracy? if we could have had those see where the raven center is like the two points like they have in madeira and all that on top of on top where that uh, the square is on top i don't know perhaps they might go back but if it all blends in well and uh, we sort the waste out we've got to keep with the raven center because that's self-funding and uh, a lot of people use that center and you know, and at the keep the back of the car park tight, but they've got to get the colours right and everything. All right, I, I'm gonna go for it. Yeah, I just wanted to come back on uh, one 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 point that I didn't make when I spoke, and that is regardless of all of the different views, it's really good that as a planning committee we are drilling down into the design and the finish and the colours. Perhaps that's something that we haven't always done, but I think that's really good news. You all know uh, that in our area, in Abbeydale and Abbeymead, we've got a new school going up, and I spent a lot of time talking to the architects and the developers about what the design of the building will be and what its finishes will be, not just the education it will give to kids with special needs. And I think that's really good, and, you know, I welcome that. And it's probably... Um, um, you know, a tribute to your chairmanship of this committee that we're able now to have these debates in some depth. That's really to be welcomed, rather than just nodding stuff through. Okay. Right. Before we move on, I just want to get a clearer steer on, on colours. So um, I'm, I have, I've, I'm hearing that on the balconies, perhaps, maybe something black might help, but we're, we're, we've not had a, a 
good steer on the top because I'm in two minds like, like yourself. I, my, I would originally have gone with the, the, the more buff colour, but looking at the, the grey actually works well. And it's, it's much more helpful when we have things like this at planning committee, I have to say, to give us a steer as to what things look like rather than technical drawings, because we're not all people who stare at technical drawings and can envisage what they are. Um, but so a, a bit, if, if, if we could just get an idea if, if the may, maybe look at putting some black in some of the ironwork as a, as a possibility, looking for nods and stuff like that. Actually, that's something. What about the, the, the roof line? I'm, I'm, get, I'm getting really mixed views. So some, so some people are, are OK with the buff. Well, not so much. Okay with the silver, silver slightly better. Or then, what did Councillor D suggest? Look at something in line with the colour of the roof of the building next to it. Members don't have to do this. You no. know, typically, it would go to offices. Yeah. The architect and the conservation officer would come up with a well, and it's only if mean, members who are strong and want to give a steer. Yeah. They have to do if they don't, then the it's so, non binding. It's non binding. Yeah. So, it's just um, yeah. So, normally, what will happen is obviously these are conditioned and it, it will come out. The officer and the conservation officer will look at what the applicant submits and go and says, is it good enough or not? Or I'll go away and have another go. It's basically what you, it's how it works. I'm just looking at obviously, members are quite particular about this site. So, we just need to get, let the officer, so when Adam goes to deal with this later on down the line, when the conditions start get, getting discharged, he, he knows what our, our, our view is of, of what our preference is, so that him and the conservation officer can then come to a decision between them, them two as to what best matches the, the sort of idea that the committee have. Um, so I've got two more people wanting to come in, and then I really do need to bring this round to um, motion. Thank you. Of the three colours for the roof level, I like the dark grey. Why do I like it? It's because it makes it recede. Why should it recede if the architect is proud of the design? The designers of, such as they were, of the Raven Centre were so proud of their gables that they, they gave them extra decoration. So can I suggest that the upper level is turned into a mansard roof, slightly reclining away from the frontage, uh, giving you that um, slight diagonal, um, which we do see in other buildings. Um, it would um, take the roof line back a little bit, make it less overpowering. Um, maybe it could be done on one end and not and not the other to break it up a little bit. Um, it wouldn't. Can I just take from the volume of the room? Second, the, we've got some sway over the palette because they are delegated. The drawings aren't delegated. We're approving the plans, and so and, and this has always been the case with planning committee. It's not something that we can, we, they, they would have to go away and come back with new drawings and that would, um, which is, isn't going to happen in reality. So uh, we're just trying to get a steer as to the best we can for the plans in front of us with the areas that we've got some sway over where the conditions are to be discharged still. Uh, Councillor Chambers wanted to... Really quickly, yeah, I get the point that conservation officers work with planners and it makes perfect sense. Um, my only comment would be um, where they put up new buildings that are slightly higher than the, the previous ones. Um, it always makes sense to try and get a colour that fits in with our British uh, uh, sky, because then it sort of off, it, it kind of merges in. Um, I appreciate it can change from blues in the summer to more greys in the winter, but there is a kind of average mean mean shading. So that would be my preference. Something that blends in with uh, the mean colour of our of our skyline would probably be the best option. That's, that's my own personal preference. Thank you. Thank you. OK, so other than this, otherwise, I'm relatively happy with this report. Uh, I'm pleased to see the extra provision of housing and affordable housing uh, completely on a brownfield site that definitely needs repurposing. Um, some reservations over the hair lane um, um, frontage, but 
on, on balance, uh, I'm happy with it. And therefore, I'm going to suggest we accept the recommendations as laid out in the report. I need a seconder as Councillor David Brown. All those in favour, please raise your hand. All those against, one, and so does that mean one abstention? Okay, so that's been granted. We're not done yet, though. Let me find my agenda. Delegated decisions, are we happy to note? Yep. So, date of next meeting is scheduled to 4th of June. Sadly, several of us won't be there. So, but if you're on the planning committee after, after the elections, then enjoy.